All right. In uh, in the in, in the last video, we started talking about God, and this is lesson three. God. Um, so we talked about his character. We talked about proof of God. Um, now let's kind of push on past that. Um, and let's talk about um, some different uh, some different things more about God and the Trinity and who and God's name. So first off, <clears throat> this chart represents God. Okay, God is the white line. I mean, sorry, not the white line. God is the white, and time and space, everything created is the black line. See, so what we what we're doing right now is we are in that little line when there's so much out there unknown. Claiming to have full knowledge in our arrogance. Think of it like this. We are termites on the very top of a skyscraper made entirely of wood. If we look down, we can't even see the floor. That is how high up we are. And we have chewed one square inch of that skyscraper. We have chewed it out. And we think that we have full knowledge, but what we don't understand is that there is a whole skyscraper that we can't even see how, how tall it is, of knowledge that we have not even brushed on. So make sure that as you're doing studies, as you're taking on science and all these different things, that you don't get this arrogant attitude that you have all the answers, because you don't. Okay, No matter who you are, there will always be someone else who knows more, more than you do in a certain area, or uh, who will discover something that you thought wasn't true, or whatever. Um, we are just a tiny speck in that. So when, uh, who are we to argue with the Creator? Remember, if He really did create things, and that means that He has such vast knowledge, He is knowledge. Okay, that, that would mean that he, he knows everything. There is nothing that He does not know. So that would mean that we, the created beings, only have a fragment of that because we are not God, and we have not communed with God in the sense of one-on-one. -on -one. So. Um, about the Trinity. All that Trinity means is three unity. And this word does not does not appear in the Bible. So I know Joe's witness for them, that seems like a real, ah, oh, we got them now. The tr word Trinity doesn't appear in the Bible. You're right, it doesn't. So uh, there's a lot of words that don't appear in the Bible that we, that we have made to clarify. For instance, the epistles of John. Did you know that epistle, the word epistle doesn't... I believe the word epistle does not appear in, in, in the Bible. Um, what about, um, um, oh, I had a good one on the tip of my, on the tip of my tongue. Um, oh, that's going to bug me. Well, it's gone now. Um, whatever I was going to say. Um, there's a lot of words that we use to describe things that aren't in the Bible. Okay. Um, so. Three per the Trinity is three persons in one essence. What the Jehovah's Witness says is that we believe that there are three gods. No, there is one God. There's only one God. However, um, there are three persons in that one being. They are all equally God. And we'll talk about how that can be in just a second. Um, but all three are distinct. The Father's not uh, sent the Son. The Son sent the Spirit. Um, and when Jesus was, oh, we'll come back to that. Um, ah, no, I won't. Um, when Jesus was being water baptized, it's important to note that he, um, um, that he claimed to be God. He was submerged under water. The Holy Spirit descended like a dove, showing traits of a character, of a characteristic, and God the Father spoke from above. So it's not it's not like modalism says where it's different faces or masks that God puts off. That the Son is the Spirit. No, no, no. There are three. There are there are very much distinctions between them. Um, so, uh, but there are not three gods, but one. There's only one God, and each person has a different different role. Um, so Genesis 1.26 says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the sky, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Let us, God, singular, said, let us. Who is he talking about? Some people would say, oh, he's talking about angels. 
Angels had nothing to do with creation. Okay? The rest of the Bible clarifies that. But uh, angels were nothing but but a created, um, are nothing but, nothing but a created thing. Um, so is he talking about uh, some other god? Well, no, because it says God singular. Is he talking about people? Well, no, because he's talking about creating people. So, I mean, no matter what you say, it has to be God. It's the only logical conclusion. Then God said, let us make man. So, um, in... Uh, Matthew 3, 16 through 17 is one of the accounts of Jesus being water baptized. And um, um, and baptized, what the word baptized means is submer to be submerged. Um, 3, 16 through 17 says, After being baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened, and he saw the Spirit of, of God descended as a dove and lighting on him. And behold, a voice out of the heavens said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Now I'm going to talk about this in just a second. More about this in just a second. But um, first off, notice the distinction of the characters. They each were doing something different in this in this in this story. Uh, also, uh, notice that when the Holy Spirit is mentioned, it can't possibly just be the active force of God, because that active force has a mind of its own. It has a, a character. It has a personality. It has the same traits that God Himself has. And you'd be hard pressed to say, for instance, the Holy Spirit sent people the holy spirit said things when um was it uh, ananias and sapphira i believe uh, lied um about their how much they made from the land paul said that not paul peter i think peter uh having a little bit of a brain fart there uh said that and you have lied to the holy spirit and then he calls the holy spirit god um, obviously, I could keep going, but we'll get to that in just a second. Um, let me read a little bit more. Um, there, so there are not three gods, but one. Matthew 28, um, 19 through 20, says, um, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So you're saying baptizing them in the name, the name of the Father, the Son, and the Father's will or force? What, what, what does that even mean? Um, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. See, what Jehovah's Witnesses do is, is they take things out of context because they don't have understanding. Um, I am with you to the end of the age. That means that Jesus' coming was a, was a physical one. I mean, a uh, spiritual one. Well, no, because he says that he's going to come in the same way that he left. In other words, he ascended physically. He will descend physically. Um, and then here, um, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. It talks about the Holy Spirit on equal footing as the Father and the Son. Um, so I think that's worth noting. I'll, I'll, I'll come back to that. Let me let me finish this up. Isaiah 45, 5-7. I am the Lord, and there is no other. Besides me, there is no God. I will gird you, though you have not known me, that men um, may know from the rising to the setting of the sun that there is no one besides me. I am the Lord, and there is no other. The one forming light and creating darkness, causing well-being and creating calamity. I am the Lord who does all these. And uh, somewhere it says, um, oh, I thought I wrote it down. I guess I didn't. Um, in another passage it says, none has been formed before me. None will be formed after me. Um, it's in Isaiah somewhere. I want to say 42, but I don't have. I, I didn't write it down. And I don't want to waste time in the video looking for something. So, um, um, husband and wife, for instance, is, is a good example of, of the way that this works. Husband and wife have different roles, but both are equally people. Yes, the father is the head of the household. Yes, and the wife is um, in subjection to the to the father. However. She is, or to the husband, I guess. <laughs> Sorry, uh, but however, she is um, an equal voice in, in the marriage. Does that make sense? So, in the same way, Jesus being being um, in subjection to the Father does not mean his character is any less. And when it, Jesus says, um, um, uh, "The Father is greater than I," notice that he doesn't say the Father is better than I. That that is actually worth noting. When he was on, when Jesus was on Earth, he was in human form. So yes, he, the Father, was greater than him. But also, more than that, um, 
the father he was in in subjection to the father and i, I could get more into that but i don't really want to uh, i really want to get sidetracked on jehovah's witness and um i can't so uh, god sending jesus does not make him Je make jesus less of god only god is worthy of praise if jesus is not fully god he is less no matter how good or godly he is he is only worthy if he is fully god and the bible said that there's only one god the book of Revelation shows that he receives um, glory. He, I'm sorry, that he receives praise. Well, only God is worthy of that. So, um, here's a good little um, thing here um, that I actually got the idea from this from Systematic Theology by Wayne Grudem. Um, here is God. He, he's represented by this circle. Okay. Here is the Father. Here is the Son. Here is the Spirit. Each of them are equally fully God. The Father is fully God. The Son is fully God. The Spirit is fully God. But each of them are still distinct. They are not the same person. Uh, however, Jesus, in 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 maintaining what he was, he became what he wasn't. Does that make sense? He became a human, whereas he was not a human before, while still being fully God. So, is he fully human? Yes. Is he fully God? Yes. So, the, the, the three there is one, and I know he's been equated to many things like um, those little lucky luck things, uh, the uh, clovers, I think they're called. Um, well, yeah, except that each of the leaves would then have to be fully the clover, and each of the leaves would have to be have the same in character. Um, so, uh, There's so much more I could say. The Father is not the Son, who's not the Spirit, who's not the Father. Okay, I know my little thing there is blocking. Let me get that out of the way. Um, see, the Spirit is not the Father, who's not the Son, who's not the Spirit. They're not. They are not one another, but they all are God. The reason why we don't understand this, more than likely, is because we can only understand things that we can draw draw a conclusion from that we can uh, compare to that we can see that we can experience um, that we have seen before so this is not something that we have we have understood because when we see people there's one person to one body so you know it's a little bit hard for under as under to understand how there could possibly be one god but three persons who are all distinct and all equally god so that takes us to Jesus. He was fully human. We see this in Matthew 124. Anyone who tells you that God is Jesus is not fully God is lying to you. Matthew 124 says, And Joseph awoke from his sleep and did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and took Mary as his wife, but kept her virgin until she gave birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. Um, so they're showing that Jesus was born of a human being, um, and, and, and so he was fully human. Um, now I do want to take a moment to talk about something. There's something called eternal generation. What eternal generation says is that Jesus is forever and always being begot by the Father. In other words, he's always been the son, and the father has always been the father. Um, in other words, father and son are not simply terms. They are actually part of God's character. And I would say I don't think that that's true. And the reason why I don't think that's true is because the only reason, only place in the Old Testament where it mentions Jesus as the son is in relation to prophecy given about what he would be doing in the future. And in the New Testament, the only time it calls him son is in relation to him coming to the earth because he was the son of God. He was born of God. How was the baby conceived in Mary? By the power of the Holy Spirit. So he was the son of God. Um, and the reason why I don't like eternal generation is first off, I don't find it biblically I don't find it biblically sound. Second off, it leads to a lot of different errors in thought that the Jehovah's Witness, for instance, have really played on. Um, and so I don't believe that father and son are part of God's character. I think that they are just simply relational terms to help us to understand something. Um, because once again, people can only, philosophically speaking, people can only understand things that they have witnessed, that they have experienced. Um, another reason why God had to give the law 
to give the knowledge of sin. Of sin. Um, so, because <clears throat> once again, time from God uh, blinds us to things. But anyways, um, so who was God before? I mean, who was Jesus before um, he was the Son? He was God, the the eternal Word, the, uh, the wisdom. Um, he he was God. Um, Luke six through seven. I'm sorry, Luke one six through seven. I hate it when I when I mistype. They were both righteous in the sight of God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and requirements of the Lord. But they had no child because Elizabeth was barren, and they were both advanced in years. Um, <laughs> two six through seven. We'll get there. We just gotta keep plowing through. Now, um, <laughs> two six through seven says, while they were there, the days were completed for her to give birth, and she gave birth to her firstborn son, and she wrapped him in clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. There we go. Luke two six through seven. And then Luke 2.52 says, And Jesus kept increasing in wisdom and, and stature and in favor with God and men. Increasing. So, um, but, oh, but he was also fully God. Daniel 7.13. Sorry, where am I going? Daniel 7.13. I kept looking in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man was coming. And he came up to the Ancient of Days, and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom, that all the peoples, nations, and men of every language might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which will not pass away, and his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. Um, and then John 5.18 And I already talked about... Um, well, I'll, I'll talk about it again, though. John 5, 18 says, um, For this reason, therefore, the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him, because he not only was breaking the Sabbath, but also was calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. Now, by Jewish law, they could only stone him if he was committing one of the, one of the sins worthy of stoning. And one of those sins was calling yourself, making yourself God. So, um, the blasphemy of God. Um, <clears throat> John 8, 5 through 8, or 5, 8, 58, goodness sakes, uh, says, um, Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was born, I am, referring to himself as the uh, eternally existent God. And then I, I, I'll i mention this also. Um, he was not created at any point in time. John, oh, he has always existed. John 1, 1 through 3 says this, And the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him. All things came into being through him. In other words, And apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. How could he have come into being if all things came into being through him? It kind of clarifies itself there. John, I mentioned this in John 1.1. 1, 1, Jehovah's Witness would say God means a God, but we know that it is God because of Caldwell's rule, which basically says that because it's the predicate and not the subject, it doesn't need the definite article in Greek. I already talked about this in a previous lesson. All that it comes down to is that it, is, it should be translated God and not a God, as any serious Greek scholar would tell you. Any first-year Greek student knows this. The only reason why the Joe is witness tonight is because then Jesus has to be God. Um, so 3.16, as some translations read, only begotten. All that that means is special or unique. It doesn't mean created. Um, Hebrews 11.17, for instance, talks about Abraham's only begotten son, um, Isaac. But Isaac, first off, wasn't the firstborn. He was a secondborn. Ishmael was the firstborn. Um and he wasn't the only begotten. He was not the only created of Abraham either, as he had lots of sons. Ishmael and Isaac were the only the first two, I believe. Yeah, they were only the first two. The other ones created the, and the Arab races and that. So, um, 
Um, then what about in, for, in Colossians where it says that uh, Jesus is the firstborn? It's talking about um, his rank not, not, as, not being first created. Firstborn does not mean first created. Okay. Um, it means firstborn. Um, and obviously you could say, well, God was the first, Jesus was the firstborn in the sense that he was born in the world so that people could be saved. See what I mean? Um, but obviously he's talking about rank there. And the rest of Colossians explains that. Colossians was written because people were saying, okay, God is not fully God, or Jesus is not fully God, um, or Jesus is not fully um, human. Okay, if Jesus was not fully human, then we only have to be saved inside, and it doesn't matter what we do. But if Jesus was not fully um, God, then we are not really saved, and we have to do things to be saved. Um, and that's what Colossians was written to combat. Uh, but anyways, He is subordinate. I'm sorry, let's read this. There was never a time when the Son was not the Son. There was never a, son, a time when Jesus was not Jesus. However, there was a time when Jesus, in my opinion, because I don't believe in eternal generation, um, there was a time when Jesus was not called the Son. I know that was worded a little bit vague. Basically, there was never a time when Jesus was not who he, what, who he is. Okay. However... And maintaining who he is, he became who he wasn't in being, being born of the flesh. Um, okay, so he is subordinate but not inferior to the Father. He, his quality is, this, is equal with the Father. However, in role, he is um, subordinate. John 10, 18 says, um, No... No one has taken it away from me, but I lay it down on my own initiative. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This commandment I received from my Father. So, um, becoming what he was not, I'm sorry, becoming what he was not, he remained what he was. Um, so Jesus is our example. He died in our place. He's our priest who reconciles us before God. Now, it's also important to note that he did abolish the priesthood. And therefore, the um, and the Mormons claim about you know them being the priests is completely irrelevant and discredits the work that Jesus has already accomplished. Um, For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son, so that he would be in the first place. So he would be the firstborn among many brethren. Now, I do want to point something out. People say, well, what difference does it make? In, in essence, the Mormons and Christians both serve the same God. Well, no, because the definition of that God is different. Therefore, it's a different being. You are making God according to your image. You're making it according to your likeness, according to your understanding. You are making a God. Um, because it is not founded on the Word. Um, and obviously... If it doesn't matter which God you which God which God you picked because either they're all equal or none of them exist, well then ultimately, ultimately once again it doesn't matter then. Why why become part of the Church of Mormon? It doesn't matter. You know we're all the same the same church. Um, or if it if it really doesn't matter, then it doesn't matter why you believe. If it doesn't matter what you believe, then it doesn't matter why you believe either. So, obviously, there's some very serious contradictions in that flow of thought. Um, the Holy Spirit, not just God's power, Acts 5, 1 through 4, uh, talks about the fate of Ananias and Sapphira. But a man named Ananias with his wife Sapphira sold a piece of property and kept back some of the price for himself with his wife's full knowledge and bringing a portion of it, he laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has is, why is Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back some of the some of the price of the land? While it remained unsold, did it remain uh, your own? And after it was sold, was it not under your control? Why is it that you have conceived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. And, he, and as he heard these words, Ananias fell down and breathed his last, and great fear came over all who heard, um, who heard of it. Um, if, if, if you're watching this class and you're a Christian, 
Don't be persuaded by the cultists' wonderful wording. They ca they'll catch you by, oh, I feel so at home here. And they'll catch you by, by all these clever little wordings. And they'll say, oh, well, this word doesn't really mean this. It should be translated as this. And this word belongs here. And this word belongs here. There's a reason why the church at large doesn't believe that. Because they have no scholarly backing. Okay, it's a cult. A cult, by definition, has to be the minority uh, view on something. Um, so... <clears throat> Acts 8.29, again, what we see is the Holy Spirit being lied to. You can only lie to a personality, to a character. 8.29 um, says, um, Then the Spirit said to Philip, Go up and join, it, and join this chariot. Once again, doing something that only a character can do, uh, only a personality can do. Uh, Romans 8.27 Oh, and going back to the eternal generation thing, if you do believe in eternal generation, it's not like you're not saved, and it's not like if you don't believe in eternal generation, you're not saved. Does that make sense? Um, and people would then say, well, you just said about um, the differences in, in character. Well, yes, but God didn't clarify to the extent that... Let me, let me clarify here. Both sides of the argument say that God is God. And Jim said that Jesus is God. Both sides of the argument say that to be saved, you have to believe in Jesus, and that's it. Okay? Belief in the Lord. Um, so all that it matters is whether one has full understanding and whether the other one, or whether the other one has full understanding. And so you have to understand that even if you have good theology, you will never have perfect theology. There will always be an area of your theology that will be off. However, as long as it is not of a major degree, there's re it's really not that big of a deal. Uh, for instance, um, I don't believe in eternal generation, so I believe that, um, that Jesus, before he was the Son, was not called the Son because he had not become the Son yet. But I believe that after he became the Son, he was not his character was still who he was he did not become um, he did not for, cease to be what he was before and that he's always been the same person he just simply took on something that he wasn't before um, but then the person who says no would say that Jesus is always the son um, and once again these are just the Bible isn't really it gives the potential where either understandings are allowed not really overly clarified. Um, but either way, as long as you still see Jesus as fully God, see what I mean? Um, the big things are important. The little things you will never have completely right, but you should always seek to make them right, if that makes sense. I'm probably making this more confusing than it needs to be, so I'm just going to press on. Romans 8.27 says, And he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is, because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. This is something that, G that the Holy Spirit is doing. Um, so, um, it takes us to the second thing there. Goosebumps are not necessarily the sign of the Holy Spirit. Sometimes when the Holy Spirit moves, it does feel good. But what people, in the, especially in the Pentecostal churches, have done is they, is, they, is they have made it a thing of, if it feels good, then it is good. And that's just not true. Um, sometimes a song will really move you, but the Holy Spirit had no part of that. Okay, Your emotions got the best of you. Just because the Holy Spirit does sometimes work in our emotions doesn't mean that every time that we have an emotion, it's of the Holy Spirit. So, um, the Holy Spirit brings us to salvation, causes our spirits to be reborn and grow, gives us power to witness and glorify God, comforts us, and uses us. Now, when I say uses us, I don't mean in the sense of what's common today. I mean in the sense of works through us to accomplish good. So, um, if you're not having grown up in the church, I know that wording can seem a little bit confusing for you. Acts 2, 1 through 4 um, says... When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place, and suddenly there came from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them tongues as of fire distributing themselves, and they rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit was giving them utterance. 
Um, and then um, in 1 Corinthians 12, 8 through 11, says, uh, for to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, and to another the word of knowledge according to the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, and to another gifts of healing by the uh, by the one Spirit, and to another the effecting of miracles, and to another prophecy, and to another the distinguishing of spirits, to another various kinds of tongues, and to another the interpretation of tongues. But one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually just as he wills. Um, so obviously he wills. That's another trait of, of a spirit, of something that, of personality. So evidence of the spirit moving is a stronger focus on God uh, and his kingdom. God will not contradict his word, so don't think that, oh, well, we've received this new revelation. It was from the Holy Spirit. Nope, if it contradicts the old revelation, it's not of the spirit. So focus on, it brings a renewed emphasis on God. It brings a renewed emphasis on witnessing. It brings a renewed emphasis on, on those things. Um, can I do this? Oh, no, I can't. Okay. Um, so, um, about God's name, um, let me read Exodus 3.13 before I start explaining this. And by the way, Jehovah is not really God's name. That, is, that comes down from Yahweh through Latin to English with words randomly inserted. It Technically, it would be J-H-V-H. -H. And so it could be Jehivi. It could be Jehovah. Um, Jehovah is just simply an alliteration of what people assume it is. So once again, restoring Jehovah's name, that's, that's not actually true because Jehovah is not his name. Um, now, um, so that brings us to what name was revealed. In Exodus um, 3, 13 through 14, God reveals um, what to, what Moses should call him. Okay, And the name that he gives is, well, as recorded now, is called the Tetragram Tetragrammaton. And what that, what that is, Y-H-W-H, -H is how it translates to English. Um, people assume Yahweh in the fact of that being maybe the verb to be. Um, in which case God is saying I am so in which name God's name is his reputation and his character in other words God is healer, God is redeemer, God is savior, God is good um, and that's kind of the view that I take on it but I do want to specify something regardless of whatever his name is Adonai is not his name that is just a, that is just a word that means God um, Allah just simply is, is another word for God um, uh, El is, is God, El Elohim. It, it just simply means God. It's not necessarily his name. That's just something that, 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 that it's a general term meaning God. It's not a specific name. Um, so his name isn't just his name. It's also his reputation. It's also his character. It's, 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 it's who he is and what he's done. Um, so um, I, I hope that that wasn't too confusing. I think I'm just going to stop there for lack of not wanting to confuse you, or for not wanting to confuse you anymore. If you have any questions um, about this lesson, uh, post it in the section, in the comment section of my YouTube channel below the video, and I will, um, and I will answer, um, and I'll answer back. Thank you for watching. The next lesson is finances.